Hello everyone, welcome, Falsche and Willkommen. My name is Gisela Holfter. I'm the director of the Center for Irish German Studies at the University of Limerick. Today's event is marking the publication of the volume Irish German Diplomatic Relations 1929-2019, which came out last November as a 13th volume of our series on Irish German studies. This volume deals with the establishment, evolution, and current state of diplomatic relations between Ireland and Germany, the hurdles that have had to be overcome, the importance of individuals and circumstances which were often outside the control of either country. All contribut contributions reflect on the multifaceted nature of Irish-German relations and often bring personal experiences to the fore, bringing together a fascinating and insightful collection. Contributors include Simon Kofny, Heiko Maas, Dijke Potzel, Dr. Nicholas O'Brien, myself, Roisin Healy, Ida Segarra, Michael Kennedy, Mervyn O'Driscoll, Joachim Fischer, Sean O'Higgin, David Donahue, Daniel Mulhall, Michael Collins, Uso von Albensleben, Eckhard Lübke-Meyer, and Matthias Höpfner. Thanks to all, and special thanks to the Irish Embassy in Berlin and the German Embassy in Dublin for their support in bringing this volume together and making it possible. And I want to thank especially Sophia Kingshill, Thomas Bellew, and Cornelia Lück. Instead of a book launch, which is not that easy to organize in current circumstances, we are taking the opportunity to look to the future where do we want to be when we reach 100 years of Irish-German diplomatic relations? For this, we could build on two events, which were also the beginning of our book on 90 years of diplomatic relations. One in June 2019 at the Irish Embassy in Berlin, marking the appointment of the first envoy, envoy in Berlin. We then reflected on the historic situation before and after independence and before and after Ireland joined the EEC, EEC in 1973. The second event in November 2019 at the University of Limerick focused especially on the diplomatic experience with present and former ambassadors in Ireland and Germany respectively, showcasing once more the high caliber of appointments that have been made at that level. I'm delighted that today's event, organized together with the Irish and German embassies, not only sees the current ambassador, Dr. Niklas O'Brien and Dijke Potzel, but also the Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Niall Burgess, join us again. Niall, thank you so much. And I do hope we can actually welcome you in Limerick again before long. We are also honored to have a video contribution from Miguel Berger, the State Secretary of the German Federal Office, Foreign Office. Furthermore, we will hear about the visions for 100 years of Irish-German diplomatic relations from a wide spectrum of experts and stakeholders, such as Dan Mulhall, Ralf Lissek, Ulrike Gasser, Professor Ida Sagara, René Böll, Dr. Sonja Heppner, Senator Jared Crowell, Dr. Hermann Rasche, Derek Skelly, Dr. Roisin Healy, Professor Ima O'Sullivan, Onye Sochek, and my colleague, Professor Joachim Fischer. Of particular importance, in my opinion, is the next generation, which is why I'm so happy that they are contributing so much to today's event. Just a quick note on the videos of our fourth year students. This was just a small part of their assessment last semester, and they had only a few weeks to create them in groups of three to four students. The results were really impressive, and my colleagues in UL and I had a difficult time just choosing three for today's event. The three videos we'll show were created by, firstly, Bella Leisert, Jennifer Ruffini, Kate Hall, Sinead Sheehan, and then Patricia Buckley, Ali Hobbs, Nisha Keen Butler, and James Stapleton. And last but not least, Shirsha Jenkinson, Rebecca McNini, and Lauren Whelan. However, I want to emphasize that there were several other contenders for our shortlist, and really the overall standard was very good, and they were very creative indeed. So well done to all our lovely fourth year students, and to you, and all Irish students who are studying German and listening now, remember, you are the ambassadors of the future. After the student videos, there will be an opportunity to ask questions on Irish-German relations of our two ambassadors. A housekeeping note, given the impressive number of participants today, we had almost 350 registrations, actually more now, 
it will be easiest to use the question and answer function. In case you want to dis continue discussing Irish-German relations or indeed anything else after this event, we will also offer an online space for social mingling, special thanks to Sonja Heppner. We will post the link to that site at the end of our event and our technical wizard, my colleague Natasha Gugi, will give a brief explanation how it works. However, first, there will be the names of the Gilbo Award winners 2019-20, and then the long awaited result of the student video competition. So as you can see, we have a really exciting event ahead of us. But before passing on to our president of the University of Limerick to officially open this event, allow me to mention the sad passing of Professor Ian Wallace, the first external examiner of our MA in Irish German Studies and a good friend of the Center for Irish German Studies. Also, many of you will remember that at our November 2019 event, we celebrated the arrival of the magnificent Gottschalk collection of some 4,000 items, bolstering our Irish German book collection. And we had planned to do this with Jürgen and Traute Gottschalk, a plan that was foiled by Jürgen's sudden death. Neither Ian nor Jürgen will be forgotten, nor our former adjunct professor, the late professor Owen Burke of NUI Galway. We are privileged and grateful that we had the support of these outstanding scholars. And while talking of excellent support, I also quickly want to mention the advisory board of the center, Sean O'Higgin, Dr. Beate Schuler, David Donahue, Professor Imar Sullivan, and the current Austrian, German, and Swiss ambassadors in Ireland, as well as the Irish ambassador in Germany. Thank you so much for your wonderful support. And now it is my pleasure and honor to ask the president of the University of Limerick, Professor Kerstin May, to open the event. Thank you very much, um, Gisela. Dear Yif, herzlich willkommen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the symposium Irish-German diplomatic relations towards the 100th anniversary marking the publication of Irish-German Diplomatic Relations 1929 to 2019, hosted by the Center for Irish-German Studies at the University of Limerick under the directorship of Professor Gisela Hofter, who initiated the publication as well as a series of events. I would like to extend a particular warm welcome to Mr. Nile Burgess, Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Miguel Berger, State Secretary of the German Federal Foreign Office, Her Excellency Dike Potzel, German Ambassador to Ireland, and His Excellency Dr. Nicholas O'Brien, Irish Ambassador to Germany. And I would like to thank the um, embassies for the support of this venture. On behalf of the university, I would also like to thank our uh, speakers today for giving up the time to join us and to speak on the occasion of launching the publication Irish-German Diplomatic Relations. The changing configuration of the European Union due to the implementation of the Brexit throws into sharp focus the many links Ireland has established with Europe since it joined the European Union in 1973. The de development of bilateral relationships between Ireland and Germany has played a vital part for the shaping of the European Union through political, economic, educational and cultural corporations and the development of pan-European governance institutions. But these formal relationships have, have formed and been informed by the manifold connection between organizations and between individuals of both countries and their shared histories. Trade links, educational partnerships, and cultural exchanges between Ireland and Germany play an important part in the further development of the European Union project and for the relationship of its citizens. The embeddedness in the European Union has made the bilateral development of partnership collab and collaborations much easier, supporting free movement of talent, tariff-free trade of goods, a shared currency, the harmonization and compatibility of higher education degrees as a result of the Bologna reform, support for education and research exchanges, and collaborations for higher education institutions through Erasmus Plus and the research framework programs with the NIANS, the Horizon Europe program, and the most ambitious to date, just having been launched. Well has benefited from both the collaboration of education and research organizations in Ireland and Germany, as well as from those frameworks for exchange and collaboration. UL is not only a pioneer of Irish-German studies and German language teaching in Ireland, but Germany is the most important collaboration partner 
for European research ventures of our university outside of Ireland. We currently have 85 active contracts with German research partners and 39 with academic and research performing organizations there, as well as uh, work with 46 industrial partners in Germany. The areas these collaborations cover range from advanced materials and nanotechnologies to manufacturing and information and communication technologies. And we are very pleased that we annually welcome almost 120 German students to UL across our four faculties, participating mostly through semester-long student exchanges as part of the Erasmus Plus program. 23 German students have embarked on research degrees, masters and PhDs at UL. And we are also hosting an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellowship recipient from the University of Ulm in the Bernal Institute in the area of polymer chemistry. 40, uh, 411 students have taken classes in German last academic year and 77 students went to German academic institutions in 2019 and 20. Our relationship with the German Academic Exchange Service, the DRD, is very productive. Gisela and her colleagues were commissioned in May 2020 to develop the Bildungssystems Analyse for Ireland, a compendium that is used by German universities to build new links with the Irish universities. And UL benefits from the contribution of a DRD lector, a teaching assistant in German language. On Monday of this week, I signed the agreement for a double master's degree in European studies with the Europa University Flensburg, which will see lively exchanges of postgraduate students between Limerick and Flensburg and the strengthening of relationships between our two universities. And UL joined Jeroen earlier this month, a young European research university network, which counts the universities of Ulm and Bremen as its members. And we look forward to developing many multi and bilateral projects with the network partners. As university and one of the largest employer in the Midwest, this institution is firmly anchored in the region and we are committed to drive its transformation through excellence in education and research. Partnerships and exchanges are vital for this endeavor. In 2020, Limerick revealed its new branded, uh, 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 new brand. It's called Atlantic Edge European Embrace for your health, Germany, Germany lies at the heart of this embrace, and I look forward to the strengthening of existing links and the development of many new exciting projects with German partners. This symposium and the publication of Irish-German diplomatic relations 1929 to 2019 will most certainly make contributions to these ambitions. And I would like to thank Professor Gisela Hofter for organizing this event and all speakers for their contributions to which I very much look forward. Vielen herzlichen Dank, Gora Miele Moragat. Nigel, um, may I ask you for your um, contribution? Okay, uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. It would be, um, though I'm in Ivy House at the moment, it would be even nicer to be in Limerick, uh, where we first began this project and marked it a couple of years ago. It's two years ago, I think, that I had the, the honor to visit Kurzberg in the company of President Higgins on his state visit to Germany. And I have many vivid memories of that visit, and particularly of that day. But the highlight for me was to stand in front of a glass case containing the Würzburg glosses at the University of Würzburg. The complicated name for those glosses is the Codex Paulinus Fitziburgensis, an Irish manuscript of the Epistles of St. Paul, written between 12 and 1300 years ago. And the magic that greeted us in that glass case were the explanatory notes scrawled on the document in Middle Irish, in the margins, by three Irish men, probably in Würzburg in the 800s. My eye fastened on one of those scrolled words, Gen Galar, the Middle Irish term for a headache. That monk, close reading manuscripts, must have been the eighth century version of ourselves, whose days are spent squinting at screens. When I thought of Heinrich Böll's words, hinter jedem Wort ist eine ganze Welt versteckt. Die sich vorgestellt werden muss. 
Behind every word, a whole world is hidden, which must be imagined. The key to understanding the origins of our own language is in that glass case. What it was to be human and Irish 1200 years ago, how it felt, how it sounded, how experience was constructed and how it was interpreted. And that afternoon, I wasn't just retracing the steps of eighth century Irishmen, but my own steps too. Over 30 years earlier, I had been a student in Würzburg, researching late medieval settlement archeology, span die Siedlungsarchäologie des Spätmittelalters. And if I'm addressing you now as Secretary General at the Department of Foreign Affairs, that's due in part to the fact that the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst awarded me a scholarship that allowed me to spend a year at a German university and acquire a language in the process. If I was there, that was because of a great German teacher at UCD, Anger at Sims, who somehow felt that I had potential. And another of my teachers, Barry Raftery, who had studied in Marburg and taught in Munich. And go back further, and the web of connections gets denser and richer, all the way to Kuno Meyer, described by W.T. Cosgrave as the greatest Celtic authority since the death of Whitley Stokes, who Cosgrave said had done more for Irish scholarship and Irish national glory than any other living man. And that inspiration goes both ways. If Heinrich Böll's Irisches Tagebuch is an enduring piece of writing in the German canon, it's not only because it tells German readers something about Ireland, but it tells them something about themselves too. My point is this, most if not all of us have a web of such connections and we are immeasurably the richer for that. And my second point is this, what is true of the individual is true also of society. Ireland and Germany are much the richer for the connections and partnerships we are marking and developing today. Let me hop across the decades again to show that. The solidarity and care shown to Ireland's Brexit challenges by Germany has been marked and remarkable. From the Chancellor through government and public service. It's been a critical part in the wider EU solidarity that we've benefited from. And as Brexit was reaching its conclusion last April, we marked the 30th anniversary of the Special Dublin Council in 1990, which endorsed reunification and set Germany on the path to integration of the territory of the GDR into the European community. Germany will never forget what you've done for us, Chancellor Helmut Kohl said to Charles Hoy that day. 28th of April, 1990. That partnership is deepening and it's deepening rapidly. Last week, the head of the foreign ministry in Berlin who will speak shortly, Miguel Berger and I co-chaired consultations involving the heads of finance, trade and the agriculture ministries in both governments. We all feel that the potential in this partnership is great and the opportunities are many. For two years now, the German and Irish missions to the UN in New York have worked closely on the Security Council agenda. As Germany stepped off, Ireland stepped on and a baton was passed. We share the same ambition for a political partnership with Africa. Simon Coveney and Heiko Maas talk regularly about that. And we share the same challenges too, to our union, our prosperity, our neighborhood, and the multilateral system that we value and depend on. If we invest and scale up, the value in this partnership can only increase. We're doing that. We're investing in both ideas and resources. Our first German strategy, Ireland and Germany, a wider, deeper footprint, was designed to revitalize Irish-German connections for the 21st century and to deepen Ireland's relationship, not only with the federal government in Berlin, but also with the individual German lender. 
a key element was the joint plan of action, which has led to increased political and official, official engagement on a number of fronts. A larger, better resourced embassy in Berlin, a new consulate in Frankfurt, a cultural attache attached to our embassy, and an Irish German language network here in Dublin. We've just finalized our second joint plan of action in the last few weeks, and that was the purpose of the consultations we held last week. That aims to increase our cooperation in foreign policy, deepen our shared engagement on EU policy matters, and forge closer people-to-people -people connections. It also provides a space to discuss and understand where we have differences. In 2029, we'll celebrate the centenary of Irish-German diplomatic relations. But I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank all of those who have been custodians of this relationship at our embassies in Bonn, then Berlin, and at the German embassy in Dublin through that period. And particularly to express thanks to Nicholas in Berlin and Dyke in Dublin and their teams for the energy they have put in to forging something deeper. When I look back on that near century, I often think of Daniel Binchy. I have a picture on my desk, which was taken around midday on Saturday, the 27th of October, 1929, on the steps of the Presidential Palace in Berlin. Daniel Binchy was then a 30-year-old scholar of Irish studies who had just presented his credentials to President von Hindenburg, becoming Ireland's first envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to Germany. He and President von Hindenburg had conversed in German about the first east-west transatlantic flight the previous year, made from Baldonnel to Quebec in a German aircraft piloted by Hermann Kohl and James Fitzmaurice, a Dubliner and one of our own pioneer aviators. They spoke too about Ardnacrusha Power Station, Ireland's great modernization project undertaken with German assistance. I'm fascinated by Daniel Binchy. I admire him. He was a fine writer and a shrewd observer of human nature. Some of his insights glitter like the gems they really are. There are only two barriers to megalomania in public life, he once wrote, intelligence and a sense of humor. And on his ambassadorial colleagues in Berlin, he wrote, the smaller and more unimportant the country which a minister represents, the more conscious he is of his great dignity. Vinci was a shy man, uncomfortable with the public dimension of his job. He confided to a friend once that for me, the round of social activities is an unceasing torment. I dodge them with increasing unscrupulousness when at all possible. Of his British colleagues, he wrote, I go to their parties with fortitude, although I wish they wouldn't give quite so many. By the time Binchy had left Berlin and diplomatic life to return to academia and begin work on what is today his enduring monument, the Corpus of Early Irish Law, later published in six landmark volumes, the embassy was well established. To his pioneering work and to those who've continued in his footsteps, and who will continue in his footsteps. And most importantly also to those universities and to Limerick who develop the connections between students that become lifelong connections, whose value is exponential. Thank you. Look forward to being with you for the program this morning. Thank you so much, Niall. This is um, this was a wonderful introduction and it really gave us the full spectrum of Irish-German diplomatic relations, and there are so many things to discover still. This is very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm now passing on to um, a video address we have from Miguel Berger, the State Secretary of the German Federal Foreign Office. Dear Professor May, dear Nile. Dear ambassadors, students, and friends of Germany in Ireland, thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's event of the Center of Irish-German Studies of the University of Limerick. 
I would very much have liked to attend personally, but communicating via VTC seems to be the new normal. Nevertheless, Neil, I haven't forgotten your kind invitation to come to Ireland and rest assured that I will take you up on this once conditions allow. Last year we celebrated the 90th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Ireland and Germany. And when our bilateral relations started back in 1929, the general notion of Ireland in Germany was uninformed sympathy. At least that is what the first Irish diplomat, Dan Binchy, reported back. Now I think our common understanding of each other is way deeper. Nevertheless, sympathy is rampant still. That anniversary was at the beginning of my times as State Secretary. Early on, I had the chance to discuss our bilateral relations with, new Neil, with you, Neil, and I was deeply impressed by the scope and depth of our cooperation and the high degree of like-mindedness, which is also evidenced in a joint document, which is called the Joint Plan of Action, which was agreed by our ministers back in 2018. And since then, we have developed a very close bilateral relations. We have deepened them even further. If you take, for example, our work on climate and security in the UN Security Council, but many other issues where we have worked closely together, and especially we coordinated very closely on the whole Brexit process but also the so-called language network in the Irish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, only last week I sat together with Neil, joined by our colleagues from different ministries like finance, agriculture, economy and defense to take stock again and look ahead. We had a rich discussion covering many areas, like, for example, the transatlantic relations, the fight against COVID, but also the future relationship with the United Kingdom. And as a result, we updated our joint plan of action with a wide range of new projects and platforms, concrete issues where Ireland and Germany are going to work together. But this is only a part of our larger mosaic of German-Irish relations. The exchange between civil societies is obviously very important, as well as between academic institutions of both our countries. When I look at some of the figures, we don't have exact numbers, but we think that we have around 30,000 Germans living in Ireland and only in Berlin uh, at least 4,000 Irish are living and are participating, working in a wide vari variety of, of professions. We have a number of important town twinnings and therefore I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Gisela Holfter, head of the Center for Irish-German Studies for her outstanding work developing our relations and I also would like to congratulate her on the Federal Cross of Merit that she so uh, deservedly received in December. Encouraging and facilitating interdisciplinary research is one of our objectives. We clearly profit from expanding our cooperation in all fields of research. This centre is a good example of this fruitful exchange. Another milestone for cultural and language exchange was the reopening of the Goethe Institute in 2018. It will continue to bring our people closer together and link up all parts of society. And talking culture, obviously this audience is very well aware of the key role Heinrich Böll, one of our famous German writers and holder of the Nobel Prize for Literature, has played. And he has shaped the image of Ireland in Germany through his Irish diaries. And I have here with me 
uh, the first edition of uh, this book, which I read uh, myself, uh, I would say, 30 years ago, uh, but which is for many Germans really still uh, a vivid memory. And I'm very glad that his retreat, the so-called Pearl Cottage, was renovated in 2020, also with the support of the German Parliament, the Bundestag, yet another display of our close links. And I'm all the more excited uh, to see later on the video message of René Böll, Heinrich Sann, uh, who will give us his vision for 100 years of Irish-German relations. Ladies and gentlemen, let me also take a brief look on where we stand now on our bilateral relations and what is ahead of us. The European Union is at the very heart of both our countries. Ireland has one of the highest approval ratings in the EU, with more than 85% having a favorable view of the European Union. Brexit has been the key issue for both our countries, I would say, in the last four or five years. It was like a sort of Damocles for many businesses and people all over Europe, but especially in Ireland. Neither of our countries welcomed this decision, but I think we had no choice but then to accept it. And I must say I'm very glad that we managed during the German EU presidency um, to finalize these negotiations at the very last minute. And I remember that I had the opportunity to brief the European Union Commission of the German uh, Parliament, the Bundestag, one day after Christmas on the outcome of Barnier's uh, negotiations. Our economies will be growing even closer. Irish customers and producers, we can already witness certain shifts in trade and transport patterns. Irish producers and consumers will focus more on the continental market, while the Irish market gains more attractiveness to the continent. Research links like, for example, between Fraunhofer Society and the Dublin City University are promising. We need to continue to bring together young and creative minds from Ireland and Germany. But it all depends, as we know, on people. It is you, the young generation, who will shape the future of our relationship. And unfortunately, I will not be able to follow your discussion in all detail, but Daike Potzel, our ambassador, will make sure that the questions raised and ideas presented are collected and reported to Berlin. Again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. I think we have come a long way, but there is still a little bit time to celebrate also our centenary of bilateral diplomatic relations. Let's use the time wisely and creatively to make it a success. I look forward to hearing your visions. Thank you very much. And we thank very much. Please pass on our thanks uh, to the State Secretary for his uh, wonderful video, Daike. And uh, do you want to take over straight away? Sure. Yeah, lovely. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me, dear Gisela. Uh, dear Madam President, Cassie Mai, great to see you again. Uh, dear Mr. Secretary General, dear Niall, thank you so much um, for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, dear Nicholas, um, my dear friend in Berlin, um, dear participants, um, dear students, um, I'm going to start off on a lighter, uh, a little bit lighter um, historical reference. Yesterday saw the 200th anniversary of Irish-born Lola Montes. Uh, maybe you read uh, Frank McNally's article in the Irish Times. Lola apparently was quite a character, quite a feminist as well, um, I take it, who among other things, um, wrapped the then Bavarian king round her finger, uh, much less so everyone else in Bavaria, apparently. Uh, she was ousted. And shortly after that, the king had to abdicate. And some say his mad love for Lola 
uh, was one of the reasons for that. So our bilateral relations are full of many interesting, often not very, pro not very prominent stories like this, uh, like this one, um, like St. Killian, again, being killed in Bavaria because he felt obliged now to inform the king of an extramarital affair of his wife. Um, or, of course, uh, a very uh, interesting uh, story there as well, the flight of hundreds of Palatines to Ireland in the 18th century, stories that very much remind me of refugee stories today. Highly recommend to go and see the museum in Rothkiel. Uh, Handel performed the first rendition of the Messiah in Dublin. I don't think many people know that. And there are many more, there are many more stories like that, Operation Shamrock, to name but a few. And to those interested, lots of literature available. And for the last 90 years, I really recommend Gisela's most recent book um, uh, as that, that we are celebrating today. It's really a fascinating and entertaining read. So congratulations on the book, Gisela. And uh, to all of you, go get it. <laughs> Today's relations are resting on a very broad basis. And I'm really very glad to be here at a time of very close and ever so friendly relations of two prosperous, highly developed democratic countries, both deeply rooted in the European Union, both sharing the same values and disagreeing on only a very small number of issues. Germany and Ireland, we share an understanding of where we want to go in so many areas. We want open markets. We are uh, strong advocates of a rules-based world order, a strong European Union, multilateralism, tackling um, the most challenging tasks like climate change and so are many others today. And uh, it's wonderful to see that we are also very strong economic partners. Um, that again goes back a long time, but um, as Ireland's now third most important trading partner, and Ireland being one of the very few countries in the world to have a trade surplus with Germany, um, with uh, two major, and I'm not going to name them now, but uh, two major German discounters as household names in Ireland, um, and so many German cars on Irish roads, so many Irish products in German supermarkets and shops, so many Germans having made Ireland their home, as also did uh, 4,000 Irish in Berlin alone, um, we indeed have come a long way. And it was very welcome news to me when Tisha Varadka said in 2020, that, and I quote, Ireland's relations with Germany are better than ever before and are becoming even more important in an EU of 27 member states. So our joint action plan of 2018 has once again then taken our cooperation to a higher level uh, on political, um, also um, economic and cultural field. Uh, during the joint vision forum in October that brought together people from the most important German think tank Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik and Dublin's Institute for International and European Affairs, um, as well as during the already mentioned recent Secretary General discussions, uh, even more new projects were discussed and the second joint action plan endorsed by our foreign ministers. I'm particularly grateful, I have to say, that um, all that wonderful cooperation went also on despite the current pandemic. We cooperated very well during that time also to jointly provide help to our respective citizens. High-ranking officials on both sides uh, stayed in touch, uh, like our federal president Steinmeier, who was supposed to come here last year on a state visit, he spoke to President Higgins at least three times during that, uh, that, that uh, pandemic. And our ministers are also in constant contact. Minister Koveni even flew to Berlin in December to receive the baton of the UNSC membership from Foreign Minister Maas um, to ensure a maximum continuity. There has been very close cooperation between our teams in Berlin, Dublin and New York on that. And this is also a very good moment, I think, to thank our colleagues in the Irish Embassy in Berlin, uh, Nicholas and your team. It's just fantastic to know that you're there and that you're always open uh, for even closer cooperation and um, for being really very good friends um, to us here and um, also, of course, to our colleagues in Berlin. So a very, very, very warm thanks to that. I think that is extremely helpful for our bilateral relations on a broader scale. 
Um, and I also need to rave today, as I do uh, continuously, about the amazing cultural bridge that we, again, with the support also of the Irish Embassy in Berlin, built between Dingle, other voices, and Haldan Pop in Germany um, in August, in the midst of the pandemic. 80,000 people, I still can't believe it, 80,000 people watched that uh, online concert in August. It's just uh, amazing. And let me also mention the many other layers of our cooperation that kept going. The German-Irish Chamber of Commerce celebrated its 40th anniversary last year. It organized a lot of online visits um, of German companies to Ireland, even during the pandemic. The Goethe Institute is now offering all language courses and cultural programs online, thus keeping the door open for people to learn German and to get in touch with German culture. And many town twinnings I know have been still active during that time. So what's next? Where are we heading? As we say in the joint action plan, there is still a lot of untapped potential. And I think um, not, uh, Nicholas and I, we agree on that. Um, and I would be very happy to see as much as possible of this potential being used on all levels. Um, despite the areas mentioned in that joint action plan, there is a lot of room for maneuver, for instance, in trade relations. German companies no doubt stand ready with high quality products also to substitute products so far imported from the UK to Ireland. And whoever is interested, the German Irish Chamber of Commerce is happy to assist. Uh, transport of goods via the sea bridge has already gone up considerably, offering quick and reliable links to continental Europe and beyond. Um, there are also town twinnings focusing on the use of renewable energy, for instance, between Galway and Pfaffenhofen in Bavaria and between Dunleer and Arlheim in Hessen, a great opportunity to learn from each other and promote renewables as one means uh, against climate change. There is certainly also more room to cooperate on the international level. Our close exchange with um, a view to the UNSC membership is but one example that is very much worthwhile and we made that very clear in the joint action plan too. There's also uh, more room in research cooperation. I think we all agree on that. It's true that Germany is Ireland's biggest partner under Horizon 2020, but still I'd be happy to see more Irish students and researchers venture to Germany to study, to do a postdoc, to do research and vice versa. Fraunhofer's new project uh, with Limerick is yet another wonderful example of successful cooperation, but there is certainly room for more. So dear students who are listening in, do take a look at the many interesting scholarships offered by the German Academic Exchange Service or the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung, for example. The embassy and the uh, DAAD are very happy to assist you. I personally continue to believe that one important task for both sides remains to get to know each other better. Stereotypes are very often a um, reason for a good laugh, uh, but I think we need to expand our knowledge about each other's current state of affairs and minds. Like in general, of course, Germans like to be punctual, yes. Uh, and we do build nice cars, of course, but why not talk about innovation in Germany more? You know, like our Cyber Valley in Baden-Württemberg, Europe's largest research consortium in the field of artificial intelligence. Or Darmstadt, the quite international city of science with all its research facilities in the fields of IT, physics, and space research. Or the over 80 Max Planck institutes and research groups in various fields. One more point, how I would love to see more books by German authors and bookshops in Ireland. How I would love to see more German movies and Irish cinemas. Um, or even on TV, or hear the one or the other song by a German artist on Irish radio. The more we know about each other, the better. Learning a language is a fantastic tool to broaden one's mind and open up new worlds and opportunities. So, and very often that interest is kicked off by travel. So once it's possible again, I hope to see even more Irish tourists in many, in the very many beautiful tourist destinations in Germany. Finally, let me invite everybody to join in to build new and more stable bridges between our two countries. Biggie Lynn, as they say, everyone is very, very welcome to get involved. Some very, very committed people might even get the attention of our federal president. And Gisela, you know where I'm heading now. 
uh, you are one of a kind in that respect. Um, and allow me to use this opportunity to wholeheartedly once again congratulate you on being awarded the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany by Federal President Steinmeier in December for your extraordinary, absolutely incredible work for German-Irish relations over so many years. I'm extremely grateful uh, uh, and uh, a, a huge admirer of your commitment, your level of energy and investment into this endeavor. And I know that a lot many people share my sentiment. So therefore, thank you so much and congratulations again. Thanks to everyone for being with us today. Um, and uh, as I said before, do get Gisela's book. Thank you. Okay, I'm almost speechless, so I, <laughs> I can't say much except for thank you so much. Um, we, we are so lucky to have you as the German ambassador, Dijk. Um, and now it's my pleasure to um, invite Dr. Niklas O'Brien, our wonderful Irish ambassador in Berlin, to speak. <clears throat> Gisela, thank you. And, and just uh, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to join us today. Um, I want to thank Professor May for the kind invitation and Gisela for your enthusiasm um, as to all things Irish German and for organizing today's event. Also, congratulations on receiving the prestigious federal honor in respect of your wonderful service. And I can only endorse everything that Dyke has said about your work in advancing Irish German studies. Um, when when Dijker was talking about the uh, reception which some previous Irish people received in Germany, I said, God, I said, I want to be a little bit careful, but all I can say is that I've got a much better reception than either St. Killian or Lola Montes, um, and um, uh, particularly down around uh, Würzburg there, which, which calls itself, you know, the, the Irish city in Germany, and you can see why it's, it's fabulous the work done down there as well in terms of advancing relations. Um, one of the things as well, you know, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about kind of official relations and, and, and um, you know, what we do to work together. But one thing, you know, which, which, which Dyke mentioned, which I really want to kind of emphasize is that we can do so much, but it, it's, it's people like you in the Irish German Studies Centre in Limerick. Uh, it, it's, it's a whole variety of groups coming together. That's where the real links are, the people to people. And, and what Dyke talks about, getting to know each other better, absolutely. And that's how we do this. Um, and, you know, interesting statistics, 1% of the German population goes to travel to Ireland every year for a short break or for a holiday. And uh, I'd certainly love to see more uh, Irish people coming to Germany. Um, thanks as well, ju 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 just to mention at the outset, um, it it's a difficult time we're living in. We've had certain consular cases, certain issues arise arising here. Uh, we've organized uh, overflow testing here in Germany. We've had Irish people coming here for specialist uh, medical treatment. So thanks to Dyke and the team in Dublin. It's been wonderful, the cooperation, and not only in this, but in all areas. Um, it, it, it's great to have kind of, you know, a, re a reciprocal kind of enthusiasm and positivity at the Dublin end. So thank you to everyone um, in, in, in the mission in Dublin. I, I suppose um, this afternoon, I'd just like to reflect briefly on the past, uh, because this is how we see the prism of today the current strength of relations, and then look a little bit at the future uh, as we look to the centenary. Um, of, of course, we, we, you know, we have strong, we've deep, we've warm relations, and that goes across many spectra. It's diplomatically, it's bilaterally, it's culturally, it's trade. Yeah, the, 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 the only time perhaps we have a little bit of kind of trickiness, though, is in the sport area. And, and regrettably, though, I think we often seem to come out the worst on that one. But, you know, we have Stuttgart in 1988, remember. Um, I just want to echo the sentiments expressed by, by, by all three speakers before me about the centrality of Germany as a key partner for Ireland. And, and it's a partnership that, that I'm, in a sense, privileged to be working on in, in, as, as we seek to even further develop and strengthen this. Um, as, as, as Niall mentioned, uh, I'm particularly aware of the long line of those who came before me. Uh, their work in formalizing the strong bonds between Ireland and Germany is rightfully acknowledged on both sides. Um, I suppose looking back to April 1921, when we're talking of centenaries um, in, in, in April, and this is something we were going to mark very publicly, but unfortunately, like everything else, 
we might mark 101 maybe next year or, or later this year, 106 months or something. We look back April 1921, Nancy Wise Power, she then graduated um, from, from, uh, from the University of Bonn, having studied Celtology, and she was appointed by the fledgling Irish state to open the Irish Propaganda Office in Berlin. And I think sometimes, what a wonderful name, the Irish Propaganda Office, and but it's certainly of its time. Uh, you know, you, you certainly wouldn't be calling an office uh, like that nowadays, but it's, it's that that was kind of, she was one of the pioneers in a sense of, of, of uh, Irish diplomacy here in Germany. And she came and reading some of the stuff uh, that they produced, they produced newsletters. And, and it was part of this about uh, just educating uh, people in Germany and officials up here about what the new Irish state stood for. Um, and, and then of course, we had the first formal Irish representation, the Irish legation to Germany, opened in October 1929, as Nile was saying, by a very young professor, uh, Daniel Binchy. And it's fascinating to read some of his reports, uh, his meetings with President von Hindenburg. And, and President von Hindenburg seemed genuinely interested in Ireland, but he also had a little bit of an interest in finding a good German wife for the young Irishman. And um, then I suppose the next phase, the war years were, were difficult, but then in the post-war period, our relationship deepened. And, and I think it's primarily through our shared membership of the, the then economic um, European Economic Community, from 1973 onwards and now European Union. And there were some seminal moments, such as the European Council in Dublin in April 1990, which Niall has referred to, and which spoke of German unification under a European roof. And we now know the pivotal role which then Taoiseach Charlie Hawhey played in advancing this agenda, despite opposition from some other EU leaders. And, and then of course, we have seen the wonderful support, not only of Germany, but of all EU member states, who stood with Ireland during the Brexit process. And that's right, because we stand together as partners and as friends should. Yes, there are differences in size, but, but you know, we're, we're equal partners in many respects. I, I've often sat around the negotiating table in Brussels and for the five years previous to, come, to coming here, I was in Brussels every two weeks sitting around that table. And I can honestly say that despite our difference in size, our difference in voting rights, the German colleagues were a pleasure to engage with. They have a respect for smaller member states, and thankfully, many of them have read Irish's Tagebuch. So just looking at the current situation, our, our commitment to this relationship is probably best summed up in the 2018 strategy paper, Ireland and Germany, deepening and widening our footprint. So the strategy reviewed the existing relationship, identified ways in which it could be further strengthened, and we looked then with a series of actions to advance this agenda. And we've carried those through. They included inter alia the opening of a prior consulate general in Frankfurt, new cultural officer here in, at the embassy in Berlin, which, which already has yielded fabulous results. And, and as Niall mentioned, more regular engagements at senior official and political levels. These resources do not come cheap and we have to ensure there is an, a return on this investment. And, and that's, that's, that's certainly one of the, one of the key factors uh, driving me. And it's not only though, as I was saying earlier about the embassy team, there, there's, about, there's 25 in the embassy now in Berlin, there's a consul general in Frankfurt with four people. And yes, we work on behalf of Ireland, but there's also the dedicated teams of specialist agencies. There's Enterprise Ireland and Board B in Dusseldorf, there's Tourism Ireland and IDA in Frankfurt and Enterprise Ireland opened a second office in Munich at the end of 2019. Then we also have four honorary consulates working on our behalf in Hamburg, Cologne, Stuttgart and Munich. And they do great work protecting the interests of Irish citizens and advancing our interests. So this is all part of the official Irish family. And, and our job is about driving the relationship with Germany. And yes, this work at a state level is essential to deepen the relationship. But as I was saying, and Dyke was saying, it's the people to people contacts who contribute so much in advancing these relations. I, it's wonderful to travel around Germany. And thankfully, I, I did at the beginning because I haven't been able to do much over the past year like everybody else. But when, when I meet people at local level working on tw town twinnings, on school twinnings, we've, we've, we've our um, 21st century schools project with Deutsche Irish Gesellschaft all over Germany. And the work which they do to build that, that relationship and the real warm affection which you see towards Ireland among German people. And this is something which we should really celebrate. And, and these relationships thrive not only because of the bilateral relations, 
um, but also because we share we share views and values, um, and we come from a common a common kind of European tradition, and and we're very similar minded on a large number of issues. And there's a strength uh, in this which, which makes us more effective as partners. And I, I believe that the most visible expression of this is our shared values in the European Union as we strive to build better lives for all our citizens. Also, we're both strong proponents of multilateralism and we support the rules-based international order. And as already mentioned by Niall, Ireland and Germany have been very proactive and very effectively cooperating on UN issues and, and the international challenges. Um, I suppose we both recognize the world is changing. So, so therefore, as we look to the 2029 centenary, what challenges will we face then? Um, I suppose who would have predicted two years ago that, that, you know, for example, when we were down in Limerick, who would have thought we just couldn't get together in Limerick for another event simply because of the pandemic and the disruptive impact which this has had. So, um, you know, Despite that, I think we have to look at, at, at further ways and new ways, uh, no matter what, what, what lies ahead in terms of working together to face these challenges, either in the EU, EU uh, bilaterally or in other fora such as the United Nations. And, and, and ju just incidentally, for, for, for those of you who may not be aware, um, it's important to note that Ireland's seat on the UN Security Council uh, it, it, in one sense, while not formally, but very much we took over from Germany because Germany came off in the 31st of December and we joined on the 1st of January. And, and um, Minister Coveney was here in, in, in Berlin in December and Minister Maas handed him over the, the symbolic ceremonial gavel, which we will use later uh, this year in December during our chairing of the Security Council. And, and our teams in, in Dublin, Berlin and New York are working together ever since, since the election. And, and this is because we share the same values and the same, same commitment to the multilateral framework. It's, it's a complex time and in some ways a difficult time to take a seat on the Security Council. And, and there's an awful lot of challenges around, but we have opportunities to work together. And we're very much about carrying on the German kind of mindset, the German values, uh, which they exhibited there in the two years prior to, prior to our membership. Um, also, as well, we're very clear that our membership of the European Union has greatly enhanced and gives us a, a stronger voice on the global stage. And we're deeply committed to the European Union, the single greatest peace project ever. So looking towards centenary, where, where do I see the relationship? Uh, first, I think we'll have an incredibly strong bilateral relationship, which we have already, and that will deepen. Um, when, when, when we meet, we're always discussing ways to cooperate further. And, and we don't take this for granted. And, and um, you know, like it, it's easy to kind of to, to dwell on differences, and this is what sells newspapers and headlines. Um, but in a sense, you know, somebody was talking to me about the latest set of consultations, and, and they were looking kind of for, for what areas, what were the problem areas. And, and, you know, I can honestly say we don't have the problem areas, and this is because we have a shared, uh, shared kind of commonality of values and interests, um, and, and that, that underpins both our approaches. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, it's not like that with all partners, but with Germany, we genuinely don't have earthens and we're so often on the same page. And that allows the bilateral relationship to develop even further. And as Niall mentioned, five Irish secretaries general met with their counterparts, five German state secretaries last week. And as far as I can recall, we only have such a similar arrangement with the UK. And it, it's the very building of this relationship that allows us to drive future cooperation. So in the next phase we'll, of, of this relationship and the joint plan of action, we'll be looking at officials at middle management level, and we want them to come together more. We've already done some work on this prior to the pandemic, but we're going to build on this even more. Uh, we, we'll explore where we, can sh where we share the same agenda, particularly on EU policies. And it's important to bear in mind that over 80% of Irish laws emanate from Brussels. So we work with like-minded partners like Germany to influence and to advance our interests. Another area where we'll continue to work together is strengthening of links between both parliaments. Already the Oireachtas and the Bundestag have German-Irish friendship committees and we'll work with them to deepen these links. Just to say a lot of my work in normal times is working with the 16 federal states, but also with the Bundestag given the pivotal role which it plays in German politics. I, I, I haven't spoken in detail today about the numerous links which exist between German and Irish groups. But just to mention some, like it's, it's areas like the German-Irish Chamber of Commerce, 
the Irish Business Network here in Germany, University Links, those which we see in the University of Limericks, the numerous town twinnings and the energy behind the excitement behind those and the school links which we have. And these links are essential to the relationship. So we, we have a framework for our cooperation going forward. We have a strong a deep bilateral relations and we're natural partners to work together in international fora. So I'm really looking forward to, to the 100 second visions, which we'll hear in the next sessions and all ideas are gratefully received. So just, just to conclude, just to say that although the pandemic has greatly restricted my ability to travel across Germany, uh, as any ambassador would typically do, my, my travels and engagements to date, unlike uh, some of my predecessors, uh, Lola and St. Killian, they've all been extremely warm and friendly with, with, with great exchanges. So um, just, just, just to conclude then, uh, when we do arrive at the centenary, uh, I believe we'll look back at what has been and will continue to be one of Ireland's longest, warmest, and one of our most productive bilateral relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was fantastic. And I think you've already passed this on to the next item on the agenda, which are the My Vision 100 second video by experts and key stakeholders. So we'll go on to that immediately. And thanks to all the speakers. It was fantastic.